Mental health moves up the ranks to become Singaporeans' top concern ahead of cancer or COVID two years ago. A survey shows nearly half felt sad or hopeless almost every day for weeks at a time. Uh, in light of these statistics, more people are turning to telehealth services to seek mental health support. And providers say that it could be here to stay as the government pushes to develop more digital platforms to address mental health issues. But while it could help make help more convenient and accessible as well, doctors also emphasize a balance with face-to-face -face sessions. Sherlin Xia tells us more. How are you? Tell me a bit more about the past week. Attending therapy is now as easy as the click of a button. One in five of Redwood Psychology's clients now use such online services or mix that with in-person sessions. The profile tends to be younger people, under 35, uh, and they do lead a busy life. They could be full-time uh, homemakers, um, full-time mothers, or they could be working a really busy job and they take a one hour out of their usual schedule to come online for the sessions. There are some clients who actually go overseas for work and they can still continue with their care. Beyond convenience and accessibility, Dr. Sao says it also helps people get around their fear of stepping into a psychology clinic. That's especially against the plight of worsening mental health in Singapore. Now, latest findings from a national survey show that nearly a fifth of residents here have poor mental health. But the silver lining is also that more than half of residents are willing to seek professional help. Now, that proportion rose from 48% in 2019 up to 57% last year. To make such support even more readily available, telehealth provider White Coat has rolled out a text-based consultation platform. Users are able to text chat with a psychologist in real time on demand. It actually becomes very much akin to a user texting a friend, only instead they'll be receiving responses from experts in the field. And so the very big theme of our service is this that we want users to know that you don't have to be facing major issues to reach out for mental support. Sometimes it is just as important to do a regular check-in. But service providers stress that digital solutions are not a silver bullet. Face-to-face -face sessions are still necessary, especially for serious cases. Because we lose a lot of information when we are talking online. Body cues are very important to us. Sometimes on screen you might not be able to see the subtle changes, whether there's a little bit of a slouch, whether there is um, restless legs or restless hand or sweaty palms. Ultimately, Dr Tan says it's up to the therapist and client to work out a format that works best. And more mental health and well-being support in Singapore. We're joined by Ling An Xie. She's co-founder of Project Green Ribbon. Oh, Ms Ling, now we just heard that news package, uh, people reaching out online. Now, mm -hmm. your organisation, so the Green Project Green Ribbon, is a non-profit organisation mm -hmm. that focuses, you mentioned, on youth and also, uh, I suppose... Uh, gives greater centrality to a family-based approach. Do you see anecdotally more people reaching out uh, to address their mental health needs? Yes, there are a lot of people who are coming up to actually seek help in various forms and specifically for us because we serve youth in crisis then I think, you know, the help, the, the kind of support that we are giving out to these individuals is a family-based approach. And all these individuals who are coming to us actually come from different kinds of, with different sets of problems. Mm. The focus on, on youths, uh, uh, Ling, you mentioned earlier that it, there, is a, there is a band, but it's, it's a flexible band. Yes. Uh, is that correct? Sort yes. of like from the age of 15 uh, to the age of 25. Age, you know, it Mental illness doesn't discriminate when it comes to yeah. age. So what are the most common sort of conditions that you're seeing? I think the most common ones are stress, depression, anxiety, and a lot of them have unhealthy coping mechanisms, substance abuse, self-harm thoughts, and ideation as well. Yeah. Mm. How do you separate out... Um, I suppose we, we actually we keep discussing this, but there's mm -hmm. obviously no clear answer. Mm -hmm. So there's 
healthy stress and there's not healthy stress, mm -hmm. which, as you say, the most obvious manifestation is trying to assuage these anxieties mm -hmm. by using uh, certain substances that are not good for us, certainly mm -hmm. in the longer term. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think today's youths are more vulnerable um, mm -hmm. to certain types of mental stresses that in the past they might not have been so vulnerable to? Is it because they don't, the environment has changed mm -hmm. or they cannot seem to find the help and sustenance that maybe young people in the past might have done? So I think one of it is stigma, of course, which we've been talking about for so many years. And another issue is that these days, social media is everywhere. It's not like before. Before, there wasn't social media. So with social media, there's a certain expectation that they want to actually live up to, a certain image they want to portray. And that itself is already a very huge stress factor on its own. Education is also catching up very quickly expectations from parents and families. So this, it's more about expectations from all angles that I think these youths are struggling with. Not so much about the lack of resources. They have the awareness, but the question is, at what point do they recognise the healthy stress or unhealthy stress? Do they then reach out to get help? Mm. You mentioned earlier that part of the approach to support, to, to treatment is, I mean, it's, it's multi-pronged, right? So you've yeah. got an awareness of the issue, you've got the coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. that they should be healthy coping mechanisms mm -hmm. because they can be unhealthy ones as well uh, that uh, an individual might rely on. And also there is the medical side. You know, they, they may need actual uh, medications to support their wellness mm -hmm. journey or their health journey. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the approach that, that uh, Project Green Ribbon will take in actually sort of supporting these, these youths? So for us, it's the family-based approach. We believe in giving these individuals a nurturing home environment. Many of the times that the youths come in, we realise that home has, is not a safe place for them. There mm -hmm. are a lot of issues that you don't talk about at home. School is also not a place that you're comfortable in. And so we believe that providing this family-based approach where we're able to be a community support for these youths is actually more helpful. Together with many plugins such as the social service agencies, the um, professional help that's needed, school and friends, and that's where we actually build up this family-based approach community. You know, fundamentally, your family is still your family. Now, you can yeah. offer family-based support, yeah. but they know what their family's like, and yeah. ultimately, they have to return or at least own their families. Yes. You are not their family. Yeah. So this approach that you have isn't in itself perhaps a weakness because at some point they have to go back and they have to realise that this was constructed for them to feel better. Mm -hmm. but they still have their own families they still need to deal with. So I think with them, our point here is to actually help them to self-support. Knowing that family doesn't only mean it's by blood. Many of them have families who are intact but yet dysfunctional. So out of that family also, what is family for them? And how do we actually create a positive environment for these individuals? It's through living and through extending this family element for them. And so when they come into us, they are very fully aware that they have to return home. But during this time, creating memories, supporting, journeying with them to a point where they're able to actually self-support before returning back to their families. My final and question, Ms. Lung. Sorry. Uh, 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 <laughs> All these things that you mentioned, the, the mm -hmm. great things, and we should achieve them, but we worry about money, yeah. skills, human resources. What are the challenges organisations like yourself face in your journey to create a more mentally healthy society? I think for us, it's really about finances. That's one. The second thing is getting lived experienced individuals with professional certifications because we feel that they'll then be able to understand the individuals more. So I think... That's where we're lacking and that's where we're trying to equip these individuals, getting lived experience individuals with professional certificate. And that's where, yeah, we're basically struggling with that at the moment. All right, thanks so much for, that, for coming in this evening. And so uh, Ms. Ling Ansir, co-founder of Project Green Ribbon.